Green Rush, Mining the Energy Revolution with Matt Watson. Welcome to Green Rush, Mining the Energy Revolution. I'm your host, Matt Watson. This week, we're going to talk about a, another critical mineral, copper, the electrification metal. Our special guest this week from TD Securities, none other than the Mr. Bart Mellick, the Managing Director of uh, and Global Head of Commodity Strategy. Bart, welcome to the program. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very much looking forward to this. I was trying to think of the best way to introduce you. Obviously, we've had a relationship for a number of years, and I was quickly researching in YouTube uh, some of your most recent works, Bart, and, and, and it kind of struck me, you're all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I think I'm all over the place in, in terms of presence, but the view seems to be uh, quite consistent. Uh, you know, particularly on copper, gold, and some of the other precious metals that are critical uh, to the, you know, to the worlds that we're going to be living in in the next uh, few decades. Uh, when it comes to electrification, I think we're quite, uh, quite consistent. Agreed. Agreed. And so let's get into the copper. So the copper situation, and I have a few slides to kind of spawn the conversation, but it's, it's been a market that's been fairly close and balanced, and now we're entering a zone where uh, the potential for it getting out of balance is, is growing and, and deficits, even in a rel relatively slow macroeconomic condition with China, at least. Uh, but we've seen copper climb in price. You know, it's touched over $10,000 a, a ton. Uh, now it's sitting at, what is it, some $9,200, $9,300 a ton uh, range today. Bart, Bart, what are your what, what are your thoughts here about the price? This metal, more than any other um, critical mineral, seems ready to be busting out. It, it, it looks to be looking for more upside. What do you think? You know, certainly that has been our impression, though when we look at the supply demand fundamentals, when we talk to uh, some of our clients around the world and uh, we look at, you know, restocking activity, we look at inventories, we really shouldn't be nearing the $10,000 mark as we are. Uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, copper, not only copper, but gold and oil are, uh, you know, surging ahead and, and people are sort of uh, going, you know, damn the torpedoes, uh, let's go ahead, uh, let's look into the future. And something very, very interesting has happened over the last six months uh, since we've had uh, first quantum issue arise. Uh, the consensus not that long ago was that we're going to be in a small surplus. Uh, the, the cited uh, reasons were slower China, uh, right. U.S. headed into a recession and production robustness. Well, so much for robustness on the production side. Uh, it's, it's it's very unlikely we're going to see anything, you know, uh, happening with the first quantum uh, <clears throat> Panama facility. Uh, so the supply side is is is, is stressed. Uh, we're getting TCRCs that are very very low. Reducing mm -hmm. the incentives uh, for smelters uh, to smelt, you know, we could even have some slowdown there as well. So the supply side isn't looking anywhere near as robust. And on the demand side, well, China, China is is very likely going to uh, stimulate uh, the construction sector, uh, probably uh, power transmission and so on. And there is mm -hmm. the United States, as we've seen the data last Friday, and and we're still well over, you know. Uh, 250. Uh, we, in fact, we were on over 300,000 new jobs in the United States. Uh, right. Today's inflation number came in with the core at 3.8, and the market is still, you know, wondering if the Fed is going to uh, cut or not. But the essence, right. in essence, the U.S. economy, it's not even a recession. It's not even, uh, you know, soft lending. We're wondering if there's going to be lending at all. And that means that we could have the recovery in demand for things like copper and other metals materialize much quicker uh, than I think anybody thought. And you add the supply side to it, and we're looking at deficits, you know, anywhere from 300 to half a million tons this year. Absolutely. I should have started with some preamble about the fundamentals of copper. Obviously, it is an electrification metal. Its, uh, its conductivity is one of the best on the periodic table, second only to silver. Um, and those two, I, I, you know, are, are clearly the top, uh, top part of the uh, yeah, electrical uh, demand is, is because of that capability. You know, some 75% of copper is in wiring form uh, for what it's worth, whether it's in equipment, 
uh, power distribution and the, and the grid itself. Um, but you'll look at some of the demands, and we'll roll through some of these demands here in the next couple of slides, but you know, there's a higher amount of copper loadings that go into EVs. Uh, there's higher amounts of copper loadings that go into solar PV. And then wind as well, both onshore and offshore, you see a, a pretty steep uh, increase in the demand versus the conventional grid uh, for those power sources. And collectively, these demands, when you add them up uh, over this next three decades, you know, some, some large, you know, nearly 50% of the global known reserves of copper today will be allocated just to those kind of renewable and clean energy transition topics. So it, it's a metal that's, I, 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 to me, feels like it's, it's can only be stressed further going ahead. Thoughts there, Mark? Oh, I, I fully agree, but I would add artificial intelligence processing center. Uh, uh, you know, folks like NVIDIA and others, we've been hearing it in the news. You know, uh, we, we can yeah. quibble. Uh, and argue whether they are correct on their full estimate. But the fact is, a market is emerging that we really haven't thought about, uh, where, you know, uh, your uh, fairly large data center will consume 2,200 or so tons of copper. And we might need lots and lots of them over the next decade or so as the use of uh, artificial intelligence processors uh, increases. Uh, copper, uh, you know, to add to your point, unbelievable conductor and also yeah. a great heat sink you know it dispenses right. uh, you know quite well in radiators um, and of course for electric uh, circuitry so that's an added factor uh, that i think is, is driving this artificial intelligence and uh, the power that's required there um in, in combination with of you cited you know evs and you know i should mention for evs that doesn't necessarily always include pure EVs like a Tesla, it could very well encompass um, hybrids, hybrids uh, yeah. where the, the, the hybrid systems, uh, right, uh, you know, to satisfy the new U.S. CAFE standards of, uh, what is it, 59 miles per gallon, uh, you know, over the, by 32, I think, 20 to 32 or so. So you add that to the fact that on the investment side, well, there is really not much on the investment side. We're not looking at massive projects being built anywhere. And if right. we are building projects, they're probably somewhere high up in the Andes where, uh, you know, or great quality uh, is lower than it was. CapEx is much higher. There's lack of water. There's lack of other infrastructure which has to be built. So very expensive to expand. Right. Um, and when you project uh, what you need in terms of copper to satisfy, let's say, you know, Paris Accord targets, well, we are certainly well, well underrepresented uh, on, on, on the supply side. And, you know, that's not just coming from me. You know, recent um, International Energy Agency and others have done studies uh, suggesting the, the same thing. And right. the transition into a net zero economy, electrification of the global economy cannot happen without metals like copper and, and other critical metals like silver. You mentioned that. I agree. I agree. This next chart is uh, going to be a bit of an eye chart, perhaps, for you, Bart, to see. But, you know, I, I look at blocks of these critical minerals on, on the top row there. I've got some of the key battery metals, lithium, nickel, and cobalt. Below that, these electrification metals. Here I, I show aluminum as well. Aluminum isn't thought of as an electrification metal, but I think going forward in time, you're going to be forced into design thrifting and alternative metals uh, for copper. There's just not going to be enough copper. And so aluminum is going to play a more strategic role, I think, in some of the high power distribution uh, transmission uh, on grids in particular. And then the silver, as we talked about. Um, the hydrogen economy metals, you know, platinum, iridium, ruthenium, and then some rare earths and some other um, critical metals, including uranium. And I've got it annotated here with these red blocks. There's, you know, a period starting in two, 2022 where all of this entire basket was spiking. And yet when I look at what's been the most resilient out of all these different blocks of metals, I think these electrification metals, copper and silver in particular, yeah, we're off of our peak some, you know, 10, 15%, but that's much less than the drops that we've seen in, in, in rare earths, zinc, tin, any other number of metals where we've seen pretty substantial declines uh, post these peaks. And so to me, this is a, a really strange indication that this, you know, the, uh, the need for this electrification metal is it, it, it perseveres no matter what the macroeconomic conditions look like. Uh, so to me, it seems to have, have a lot more robustness than some of these other categories. 
Any thoughts there? Yes, you know, uh, yeah, absolutely. First of all, uh, copper, you know, it is a well-established metal with uh, with everything from OTC trading to trading on the LME to trading on the COMEX and, and, and so on. There's a lot of liquidity. There is stable demand in other parts of the economy for the metal. Uh, you know, when you're talking increasing uh, the representation of copper in a EV vehicle, you know, you're, you're, this isn't something new. We're not really quibbling about it. Uh, we're just adding to already a massive demand that exists. So copper has been fairly stable, relatively speaking. Um, right. And it is one, in my opinion, that really is difficult to substitute away from. Uh, you right. aluminum and, and aluminum, I think, will find some substitutes, you know, maybe radiators and stuff like that for, uh, uh, for, for vehicles, some, some, some wires, uh, certainly not internal wires. You know, you have the semiconductor problem, crystallization where alternating current, you know, uh, creates heat resistance because you know, semiconductors are, are one way. Uh, so, so there are there are some technical issues, and uh, aluminum is a good solution for some of it. But let's let's you know, and it's cheaper. But the fact yep. of the matter is, we could very well be taxing cheap aluminum because of of, of carbon uh, footprints uh, down right. the road. Right. So, um, yep. you might not have as much thrifting uh, opportunity uh, as I think many people think. Uh, but yep. there is some. There's stable demand. And investment, I think that's the key because of this volatility. I know in lithium, for one, uh, you know, the, the fair question is, you know, why should I take a risk in it if my asset go from being valuable to being underwater uh, very quickly? So there need to be, in, in my opinion, some sort of hedging solutions where you can stabilize the price, where boards of directors and investors uh, yes. feel that you know, if they invest in an asset, uh, it's not going to go from you know from uh, from zero to a hundred and then back to zero. It, it's just too much volatility. And I think that might explain some of the reasons why we're not seeing as much investment as we know we're going to need down the road. Absolutely. I, you, you brought up a great point that I was going to raise. And you know, if, if from a mining uh, investor perspective, you know, lithium having this dramatic roller coaster of a ride or, or nickel or cobalt, man, that does not inspire long-term confidence in mining investment in these segments. Uh, even though you can, you know, guarantee the lithium demand is going to be there. Um, I, I, again, I just think the the copper it's it's just so essential to the you know function of electronics. It just seems to persevere no matter what. Um, you know, the other design shifting or alternatives that we're seeing used is in subsea cables. Uh, we're seeing groups uh, pull on carbon steel as a, opposed to copper for what are going to be high power transmission lines uh, on the bottom of the seafloor uh, to help transport renewables, let's say, from North Africa into Europe. Um, and um, so we're seeing some design decisions made there uh, for cost and for just for thrifting. But, um, but I, think, I think you're, you're right. There's uh, going to be some limitations to how far you can really do that, do these alternatives and do this design thrifting. And now just looking at some of the loadings, you know, to your point on you know, conventional ICE, uh, internal combustion engine vehicles, gas or diesel, you know, typically you're looking at about 25 kgs of copper per vehicle, whereas hybrids are, are basically double that. BEVs are higher still. And of course, EV buses and heavy duty can, can be very substantial loadings. So okay. we're, we're seeing the vehicle market pulling more demand. But I think what really strikes people when you dig into the, the detail is look at some of these other energy sources for electricity generation. You know, the conventional grid consumes you know, 1,500 kilograms per megawatt. But those numbers, when you get to offshore wind, are f phenomenally much larger. I mean, there's some 8x larger in, in scope than the conventional grid. So um, even some of this renewable deployment plans that are coming out are going to be pulling significant weight for the ride as well. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, that's going to be a phenomenon uh, that will be with us. And, and, you know, at some point, we're probably going to have even more grid requirements if we are able to uh, solve some of the storage problems. Uh, you know, the, the, the notorious issue with renewables is the sun doesn't necessarily shine when you need the power. Uh, apparently, right. you know, most places in the world doesn't shine in at the nighttime and wind doesn't right. necessarily blow uh, at your convenience. So 
you're going to have to have a storage solution very much like you do for natural gas, where you have salt caverns and you pump gas in and off peak uh, uh, periods. Uh, and, and that, you know, that will need some sort of uh, improved smart grid uh, where you're going to have to grow capacity, everything from switch gear to step down transformers and, you know, oh. whatever else you need. And that all uses copper. I'm not sure uh, any other metal is a substitute. So yes, some transmission lines might use aluminum, uh, even maybe steel in some circumstances, though you know, I, I, I have my reservation about some of it, uh, but, but other uses just really no, no, no substitute. And there's plenty of demand over the next 20 years to go around, uh, for it that I don't think we're going to have to worry too much that, uh, other metals are going to, you know, displace copper in any major way. Right. You know, the other part of the market I didn't really dwell on was the recycle streams. You know, some 35% of the copper supply is met with recycle. Uh, it's a pretty healthy and consistent uh, recycle stream that, um, you know, supports the supply. Uh, there's no reason to think that's going to shift going forward. I think there's a, a pretty good system of harvesting it. Everything from e-waste um, to automotive scrap to um, to an, uh, infrastructure and, you know, uh, infrastructure scrap even that uh, we're they're very effective at collecting this wiring and getting it back into to recycle for further use downstream. So there's some good stability on that side. On the automotive, um, now I, I show all these demands, I show it in the context of what I call a base case versus a zero emissions mandates case uh, for the vehicles. Um, the zero emission mandates case is going to be much more heavy loaded with BEVs. My base case is basically a 50-50 mix, a moderate mix of hybrids and EVs. Uh, through the year 2050, and and yet we see the copper demand in total for vehicles in the base case climbing to nine and a half million tons a a year uh, by 2050, with some seven tons of that being either hybrids, plug-in hybrids, or BEVs uh, pulling that demand. the the zero demand the zero emissions case. If we're able to hit all these 2035, you know, EV mandates, um, it would be a faster and it's more significant copper pool. But I, I look at these numbers, and, and these are, are pretty shocking numbers to me, just on how much demand is coming from the, from the vehicle segment going forward. Again, there's just no denying this, and I don't think there's a design alternatives or significant thrifting that's going to help us much here. Uh, it seems inevitable on the on the vehicle front. Would you agree? I, I think so. I mean, for no other reason than the design period uh, and, and then implementing and testing. Uh, this can right. take well over a decade. You know, we've certainly seen that uh, when we wanted to load more uh, platinum in catalysts uh, in response to very expensive palladium. Uh, that took a very, very long time uh, to happen. I, I don't imagine it's going to be much quicker to, you know, design copper out of a lot of these applications. Uh, you, even if you can, uh, there right. are very, very significant time lengths. Right. Here's the next demand chart. For those of you who followed our silver uh, session last week, we talked about how much solar PV is needed. I think we're approaching the point where we have enough build capacity, and it's just how do you use that build capacity? So we did some 460 uh, megawatts of new installations last year. Let's say we climb that a little bit further to about 561 and go flat year over year. This will get us to some 14 terawatts of installed solar PV by 2050 which is the arena stated goal. Um, so, you know, the copper loadings will look like this, as opposed to a state where, let's say, instead of 14 terawatts of solar PV, let's say they double it and they want 28 terawatts, that would be a little bit more aggressive growth plan for both silver and copper, pulling, a, 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 again, a, a very significant load of, of copper demand along for the ride. Um, and be, again, I think you're right. There's transformers, high-power transformers. There's all the... Uh, you know, all the hardware on site, all the wiring, all the coupling of the modules, an awful lot of copper going down in these solar installations. There's, there's no avoiding this. And then finally, right. just and wind. That's, go ahead. Go ahead, Bert. You know, and, and certainly, you know, for the interruptibles, you're going to have to have a smart grid. And as I mentioned right. before, uh, some sort of storage capability. And, and that means the grids might be a lot more complex and require more metal than uh, than I think we even now we're estimating. Right, 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 right. 
I agree. I th- I, you know, there is no storage solution presently on the scale that we need to, to help balance the grid both within day and then even seasonally as well. The hydrogen economy is thought to be the, the best s- complete s- serving of that need, but uh, there's a potential to put a lot of strain on the PGMs going forward if, what's, if you overinstall these variable renewables and find yourselves with a very unreliable grid, which is basically the path that we're on right now. Yeah, I, I, you know, right. I, you, I, I, yeah, you I, need I a reliable base load. <laughs> it's a bigger issue than people realize. You know, wind, I've talked about wind, you know, especially offshore wind is very much, um, much more expensive than they thought, nearly twice as expensive as initially promoted. Um, you know, a lot of the problem is the, again, these high power transmission lines, getting them on shore, uh, again, requiring lots of copper. So the farther offshore they are, the more copper is involved. Um, and so we see a, a mix that of, of onshore and offshore copper demand that looks like this in my base case for about half of what Irina wants versus Irina wants a full 8.1 terawatts, terawatts, terawatts rather of uh, wind installed by 2050. Your copper demand will look more like this if we were able to accomplish this. My sense is there's, there's kind of a more of a favoring of solar PV in the near term. I think some of these wind installations are, are hitting the brakes. So I think you're going to see many of these agencies like Irina start favoring a plan with more solar and a little bit less wind is I think where we're headed. Uh, but again, yeah. there's just no avoiding the, the cabling required to connect these, these renewables. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and of course, you know, with, with that much concentration into these interruptibles, uh, you, you, you're gonna have grid stability issues where, you know, we, we, we might have to look at, uh, you know, maybe uh, nuclear power, <laughs> yeah. uh, as, as, as base load here, um, uh, to, to make sure that the, 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 the grid is stable. Uh, as you were saying, without a, a viable storage solution, certainly on the you know on the power cell hydrogen side, uh, we're we're nowhere near there yet, and no one is really seriously thinking about it. Yeah, you know, I keep using California as a, a reference in every presentation I give. You know, we're curtailing solar most every single day in California. People don't believe that, but we generate too much you know solar, and, and the system can't absorb it all, and as a result, they have to curtail a, a significant percentage. And the higher and higher your variable renewable penetration rates are, the more that you're curtailing year over year. So it's, it's a real problem that I think will be manifesting itself publicly a lot, a lot more clearly for everybody that to see here in the, in the coming future. And then yes, finally, and not I, in a good way, Matt. <laughs> yeah, not in a good way. Exactly. I think uh, you're going to have some people that are very pissed off with where we're headed with this whole discussion. And so I roll up the total demand. Again, my base case on the left um, versus a zero emissions in a full renewable package on the right in my high case. And in either case, you know, the, these show trajectories to over 50 million tons of demand per year by 2050, whereas the high case takes you closer to 60 tons a year. These are astronomical numbers. And, and I, you know, the first thing I try to teach people is some context. So I think in total on copper, we've mined some 620. A million tons of copper to date. Well, what I'm showing you on this demand chart, even on my base case from 2021 to 2050, those three decades, look at the demand number. It's, you know, 1100 million tons of demand. And yet we've already in the history of mankind only mined 620 million tons to date. You're going to have to mine roughly 2x what we've mined historically in the next three decades just to give people perspective. And that's, that's just a staggering thought for people to, you know, to, to wrap your heads around, that's, that's a big number. It, it is a big number, and it's going to require massive, massive amounts of CapEx. Uh, right. We're going to have to convince people that, you know, uh, having a mine in their area is for the greater good. We're going to have right. to get social um, sign-on uh, for it. We're going to have to have regulations that gives certainty to investors that if I go through the process, uh, I right. can actually start building my mind, which is really particularly in North America, not the case now, uh, where right. you can have lawsuits and you know projects get delayed years and uh, years and years, and uh, you know a lot of places, also like the Congo, where there is a lot of copper, um, the yeah. political situation and the stress. The, are there. So the problems aren't just 
lack of investment. Uh, the, the problems are broader than that. Uh, you know, there are societal issues. Uh, there are governmental issues. Um, you know, we, we've been seeing a, a, a mindset develop recently where uh, some big investors were not very favorable to mining, uh, you know, that includes copper because they have, by definition, a high carbon footprint. Uh, right. And, and so ironically, we're this or, you know, advantaging these industries because they are, you know, quote unquote, dirty. Meanwhile, it's the only way to really clean up the world. So, you know, we, we, we kind of have to get that, uh, um, that mental dissidence out of the way and, and have to have policy and, and, and education uh, consistent in informing people that, yes, you know, uh, mining may not be the cleanest industry um, in the world, but we're producing X pollutants to reduce 10X of pollutants down the road. And, and, and frankly, you know, the incentive system, I don't believe is there quite yet certainly societal sign-on or, or knowledge of, of, of those issues isn't there either. Right, right. No, you, you brought up a good point about some of these other constraints. Uh, I, I like to pick on the case. You look at the reserves. Where do we know the USGS known reserves? Chile stands out for having a, the largest share. And yet Chile is so fundamentally important to the copper you know, mining industry today. And, and I saw an interesting statistic the other day. Some 30% of Chile's power grid, national power grid, goes to support mining alone. And yet we want to grow all this lithium production and copper production in Chile. You know, what is Chile going to look like? And Chile's a good example because there's, there's a country that has struggled with different fits and bouts at uh, trying to put some nationalistic policies in place uh, to harvest more of the benefit from that mining activity than, than uh, they get today. And they struggled with how to structure that. But again, another policy situation in Chile, in a, a really critical region, how are we going to pull this off? It's, it, there's a lot of technical challenge and business challenges here to, to get Chile to really ramp copper the way people think it's going to be needed. And I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. North America. Uh, yes, you know, I mean, uh, ultimately. Go ahead, Bart. We, we, we do have to get our act together and, you know, the United States has to work with countries like Canada and Mexico, uh, both uh, mineral uh, rich. Um, I'm just talking about the NAFTA region here for a, for a moment uh, where we're going to have to coordinate, uh, where we're going to have to take protectionism off, um, uh, you know, where trade can go back and forth both ways to everybody's benefit. Uh, and, you right. know, we're going to have to involve industry, governments, uh, and the the, the financing uh, community uh, all at once. That is really not happening in any you know significant way that would lead to a consensus and then global or international policies uh, that are firm and uh, transparent and enforceable. Uh, I, I think there is right. a long way to go, and you know I'm afraid that this transition may take a little longer than everybody would like it to. Agreed. You know, one of the other startling facts in the background is just the copper ore grades. And so the chart I have up, it shows a long-term historical picture of where copper mining has been historically. But it's, you know, been up as high as 3 to 4% in the 1900s. And now, you know, if you have a 1% deposit, you're sitting on a, a premier mine, right? Uh, now we're dealing in fractions of 1% as, as often the, the grade that we're dealing with. Um just driving the point home, just your tailings and the amount of material that you need to mine is, is growing exponentially here to get to the remaining available copper. Um, so this this really puts a technical challenge in front of us as well. Yeah. And, you know, I would add to that, you know, in addition to the fact that ore body grades uh, have been deteriorating over, over the decades, you know, clearly... Uh, Everybody wants to go for the easy stuff first, uh, but it's also increasingly in, you know, difficult parts of the world. Uh, right. It could be in high up in the Andy mountains where there is really a shortage of water, which, which you require, uh, power roads, 
uh, so uh, you know maybe geopolitically un unstable uh, parts of the world where where you know I don't know how you solve that one exactly that, that also lack infrastructure and you're going to have to build all that. Uh, there's going to have to be some sort of financing available. There's going to have to be assurance for investors that you know they're not putting good money you know in an you know in in a problematic area. Um, right. You know, the first quantum experience, I, I think, is quite telling, uh, where, you know, all of a sudden you thought you had a operational mine and, and then you didn't. Um, right. So, you know, and, and I think that can only be done on a governmental level where these agreements uh, are, are made and, and commitments are made and, and they're firm. Uh, but I think, you know, we are seeing the problem of rising nationalism and resource nationalism in particular, you know, Indonesia comes to mind. Uh, where I think this is going to be very, very difficult. Um, yep, I agree. Not insurmountable, agree. but it, you know, not in, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a big global coordinated effort. Uh, it might be more piecemeal, and, and, and you know, and, and, and that that means delays. Right. And then I'll finish up the discussion on uh, copper. Here I have a chart that shows every five year an interval of what the USGS known reserves were at the time. And you can see a, a growth in those reserves that are available. And then I go to an, an annual mode here, 21, 22, 23. So here's the most current information. But when you translate this into years worth of supply, we're still sitting at about 37 years worth of supply uh, before we exhaust our, our known reserves. And not that there isn't more metal out there. Obviously, there is. But it's going to require exploration and turning that mining wheel, if you will, uh, to develop more sites and to, to have more mines available and, and again to your point we've got to break this nimby this not in my backyard mentality we're going to have to mine copper pretty much everywhere that it's available <laughs> in the north america and, and across the globe chile as well um we're going to have to mine all of these uh, more substantially to hit these numbers um and, and and so again just painting a picture of the challenge this is really this growth has slowed down a bit we'd like to see this known reserves number continue to climb but all we have right now is line of sight to 37 years worth of supply at present rates of consumption. So any yeah. thoughts here? Well, you know, you, you, you're right on point. We, we are going to have to mine it wherever it's available. Uh, I would like to see North, North America uh, commit more of, you know, political and uh, actual capital because uh, right. for our security of supply, we, we are... You know, uh, we are a legally stable, security stable area with court systems, enforceable laws. Um, and we feel you know, North America kind of just in time uh, system. Um, and there could be a great symbiotic relationship between uh, our, our three countries. You know, we could, I could certainly include Europe in this, but we're going to have to get serious about declaring you know, something like silver, also a critical mineral. As, as well and make policies uh, that allow that to happen. Uh, I'm not, you know, right. a big fan of, of subsidies, uh, but uh, there are, there is room for governments to act where markets fail. We, we've done it with, you know, here in Canada with mortgage insurance um, mm -hmm. uh, to, to protect, uh, you know, uh, financial institutions from default. Uh, we can do the same thing on, on the head side. We can you know, get creative with offtake agreements with major users where, where they agree to prepay uh, on an index basis to cover the capital costs and some sort of rate-based return like we do, used to do with utilities. Uh, so we're going to have to think outside of the box uh, to make sure this happens. At this point, it really isn't. I, I agree. Well, Bart, I just can't thank you enough for your time today. Um, you know, I tried to focus on some of the, the fundamentals of the supply demand picture, but I think the fundamentals of copper are pretty fundamental, right? I mean, we're really, this one's pretty straight up, straight, <laughs> straightforward. And, and of all the things on the periodic table, this is one of the lowest risk investment um, metals that uh, you can pick. Uh, this is something that we're absolutely going to need down the, down the road. To me, this is a, a slam dunk for investors to, 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 to circle the wagons, if you will, and, and to help the global cause. Any, any final thoughts, Bart, before we wrap up? Uh, the, I, I would say that we, we, you know, we, we agree with that view. I think, you know, five, 10 years down the road, we are going to be in a structural deficit. Uh, and the problem, of course, with commodities is you cannot use more than you produce. 
Uh, you right. run out of inventories and guess what? You know, you, you have demand destruction. Um, a, but as optimistic as we are, uh, we also have to be cognizant of the fact that there are cyclical forces like interest rates and recessions uh, over the next uh, couple of years, at least, uh, that can uh, cause copper prices to 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 move lower. Uh, that, to me, would be a signal that it's temporary and, and maybe we should, you know, look at uh, buying from, from those points. But uh, we, we have to be prepared to look at volatility. All these commodities are notoriously you know, so-called supply, you know, price inelastic and they're volatile. Uh, so in mm -hmm. the short run, there'll be volatility, but longer term, I think it's up, up and away. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you so much for your time, Bart. Join us uh, next week. We're going to have uh, Mr. Philip Walter, who's the executive VP of business, business line hydrogen systems for Horaeus, uh, who's fully immersed in this hydrogen economy discussion and this this grid balancing technology that Bart's talking about that's going to be so important to the future power grid with more variable renewables supporting that future power grid. And so we'll, we'll have a, a healthy discussion on the hydrogen economy and the implications to PGMs next week with Philip. Again, this is Matt Watson. This is Green Rush, Mining the Energy Revolution. Join us again here next week. Thank you all. Take care. Green Rush. Mining the Energy Revolution with Matt Watson.